Good morning, and thank you very much for the invitation. My name is Felice Darko, and I am a pediatric neuroradiologist in London. Uh, I will be speaking about posterior fossa malformation. Uh, and um, uh, just to say that all my lectures are on YouTube. So if you are interested in some pediatric neuroradiology and head and neck lecture, um, just check it out. Um, we'll put out my camera and this is summary or presentation will be case-based. I will go through the uh, normal abnormal anatomy, system malformation, differences between cerebellar atrophy and cerebellar hypoplasia, which is relevant. Uh, Ponto cerebellar hypoplasia and a pattern recognition approach. So uh, these are some of the references that I think are very, very helpful. I will um, show some other references during this lecture. But let's start with these two cases, one on the left, another on the right. And um, what you can see here is that, uh, um, of course, the posterior fossa in these two patients looks very, very uh, different. So my question for you is, uh, uh, what is normal, what is abnormal, are both normal, both abnormal, or one is normal and one is abnormal. Of course, uh, um, every one of you have probably seen a posterior fossa MRI, um, and they, you can easily guess that the, the, um, the one patient that has normal findings is uh, the, uh, the one on the left, so the right is abnormal. But the point is that, of course, these are striking abnormalities here, but why is that? What are the um, indication of normal anatomy on MRI? So there are really few stuff that once you, you, you um, uh, look for them, it's very, very easy to distinguish normal and abnormal. So first of all, the length of the pons on sagittal midline has to be between 1.5 and 1.8 of the midbrain and medulla oblongata. Why is so important? Because if you have an abnormality in this ratio, like in this case, you have something that we call patterning defect. First thing. Second thing, the base of the fourth ventricle here in yellow is a straight line, and the apex of the fourth ventricle, so-called fastigium, is acute. If this is obtuse, you have a problem, you have a malformation. So, if you have this problem in the brainstem of abnormal ratio patterning defect, if you have a problem in the vestigium, you can be dealing with Dandy Walker. The cerebellar folia are parallel to the calvarium, so they give you this onion line shape. And finally, and you can see the difference here, the fissure are radiating toward the cerebellar nuclei, in particular here, the dentate nuclei. And you can see here in this case, uh, this is normal on the left, on the right, this is abnormal um, fissures. So now that we know how to recognize something mean, normal and abnormal, let's look at these two children with both with hydrocephalus and something wrong in the posterior fossa. Now, in this case, you can see that the fastigium, so this apex of the fourth ventricle is flattened and the tegmental vermian angle is enlarged. On this other side, also the tegmental vermian angle is enlarged. So the fourth ventricle is enlarged with direct continuation with the posterior fossa, but the fastigium is normal and the cerebellar uh, uh, vermis looks normal as well. And the axial also look very, very different. So, What's the difference between that? Well, the, this one has an hypoplastic vermis, so this is abnormal. Dilatation of the fourth ventricle and the fastigium is flattened, and very large posterior fossa associated with hydrocephalus in this case was shunted. This is the definition of dandy walker malformation. Now, if you have something with enlargement of the posterior fossa, but the fast with the rotation of the vermis, but the fastigium is present and acute angle, despite the dilatation of the ventricle, the posterior fossa more or less has normal size. This is a black pouch cyst. So what is the difference between the two? Basically, the fastigium and the presence of abnormal vermis. So if you read one of the papers that I showed you before, they are very, very nice paper you can um, understand that looking at the vermis is very, very important. And to look at the vermis, you need to know how the anatomy of the vermis is, and that in particular, the vermis has nine lobules that are here, and how important it is to do a 3D um, a T1 of the, um, of the brain, which is the choice for giving you the, in order to give you this high resolution 
um, image of the berries. Other cystic malformation are this, which is basically a posterior force assist that pushing a bit the, the ventricle, but the fourth ventricle is not enlarged, or simply just mega cisterna magna. Just the cisterna magna is a bit larger than expected, it's a, bit, a bit too much space, but the size of the berm, bermis is normal, uh, in particular reaching basically the obex. We have measurement, I will come to that later on, but if you reach, uh, if the, the vermis reach the obex of the brainstem, we can reasonably think that this is normal. So now we have seen a dandy walker malformation, lake pouch cyst, arachnoid cyst, and megacystina magna. These are the main uh, cystic malformation. And this is a very useful scheme to recap. When you have, first of all, when you have a cystic malformation of the posterior fossa, what you look at, the vermis. If the vermis is hypoplastic and markedly rotate, rotated, as we have seen before, this is a dandy walker. The other, they all have normal vermis. The fourth ventricle here is normal, but we saw before in both Blake pouch cyst and dandy walker malformation, the uh, fourth ventricle is enlarged. Just the Blake pouch cyst has normal vermis. The posterior fossa can be enlarged in dandy walker malformation, but this is very uh, relevant, uh, uh, less relevant. There is another important abnormality that sometimes in literature has been kind of uh, associated uh, with the dandy walker. There is a bit of confusion in so-called inferior vermis hypoplasia. Inferior vermis hypoplasia is basically hypo hypoplastic vermis with everything else normal. So now we have the fifth, let's say, cystic malformation or malformation of the of, of the, the vermis. So dandy walker, vermis clearly abnormal, flattened vestigium, persistence of the Blake pouch cyst. The vermis is normal, but it's a bit rotated and the fourth ventricle is enlarged. But when you have a small vermis, but everything else is normal, you call it uh, vermis hypoplasia. So you see these two cases where the vermis is a bit smaller, but as you can see, this can be a bit difficult to pick up vermis hypoplasia. So we sometimes can measure. There is this beautiful uh, um, 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 paper led by uh, Professor Soto Ares that shows uh, among uh, several measurements, the high of the vermis is very, very important. This is how they measure. And you have different boy and girls per age. So if you have a doubt, measure it. Now, it can be, so what's new in terms of uh, um, the difference between Blake Pouch, uh, sorry, uh, Dandy Walker malformation, cerebral hypoplasia, and other abnormalities. Uh, um, I, I told you before there are some radiological criteria for the Dandy Walker malformation, but there are new papers that I really wanted to show you because uh, are very, very interesting. First of all, this paper uh, by uh, Dobbins and colleagues showing that. Uh, they found that most of the dandy walker malformation in comparison to the cerebellar hypoplasia, they do not have a genetic cause. So they say that uh, most of the dandy walker, they have a vascular insult prenatally, while the cerebellar hypoplasia uh, is more often related to genetic defects. So if you have something like that, cerebellar hypoplasia, you see the, the vermis is far higher than the obex or uh, something like that in the Diaz-Logan syndrome, you measure and you confirm the cerebellar hypoplasia. Uh, but if you have a dandy walker, you basically do not find a genetic insult most of the time. So this change a lot in terms of risk and prognosis. So dandy walker seems to be due to a prenatal insult first thing. Then how to distinguish dandy walker? I told you this plastic and small vermis, enlargement of the fourth ventricle and flattened fastigium. But now we have some radiological literature giving us some other um, useful tips. First of all, the dandy walker malformation will have this tail here at the back of the vermis. This tail sign is supposed to be typical of dandy walker. So this by the Italian group is very interesting paper that you can use. So you see this uh, flattened vestigium, small rotated vermis, tail sign, call it dandy walker, and again, dandy walker prenatal insult. And there is a recent uh, um, uh, paper from Whitehead and colleagues in pediatric radiologists 
that add another radiological sign. He basically um, uh, showed that the, the tenia telacoroidea and uh, choroid plexus uh, here in the normal position uh, should be in the inferior part of the fourth ventricle. And this is the, the, the axial view. If you have a black pouch cyst, so again, enlarged ventricle, normal size vermis, you will have that this complex is below the vermis. So it's not here anymore in the fourth ventricle, just a bit below. This is not the tail signs, just the choroid plexus uh, uh, tenia colloidea. But if you have a dandy Walker malformation, this uh, tenia telacoroidea plexus will be attached to the brainstem. And why is that? Why there is this difference? So you can again distinguish between blade pouches and Andy Walker, which is relevant because um, the, the, the prognosis changes. And then you need to distinguish between Dandy Walker and cerebellar hypoplasia. Um, Again, because uh, the, the prognosis and the genetic, uh, the, um, the etiopathogenesis that is most likely genetic for cerebral hypoplasia, less likely for uh, than the Walker are relevant. So you can look also at the Tela uh, Choroidea tenia complex. But why is that? There is this new paper. So I'm, I'm, I'm suggesting you a lot of papers, but then you can come back to my presentation and look at, at YouTube if you want. Um, uh, and this paper shows why there are these morphological changes. They show that, uh, you see, this is normal, this is Dandy Walker. There is disproportionate um, hypoplasia, in particular of the uh, posterior cerebellar lobule, which is here, which remains outside and inferior to the uh, rest of the vermis. And the tail is actually composed by this embryological structure that is called rhombic lips. Normally, rhombic lips is internalized here during the normal development of the posterior cerebellar lobule, lobules, and uh, then disappears. But in the work it remains outside because there is an insult and this cannot develop properly. And actually, this is why in the dandy Walker here on the right versus uh, uh, vermian hypoplasia, in vermian hypoplasia, in both of them, the size of the vermis is small. But in dandy Walker, you have the tail sign, so this rhombic lips that remains outside and inferior to the vermis, and flattened fastigium. So the, 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 um, uh, the anterior aspect of the vermis is flattened, while in the cerebellar hypoplasia, the fastigium is acute. Why? Because in the dandy Walker, you have a damage, most likely an insult, a vascular insult before the 14th week of gestation. This part here, so the rhombic lip does not internalize in the cerebellum, the posterior lob lobules do not develop, and the fastigium remain flat. So now you can distinguish these two situations, cerebellar vermi hypoplasia and dandy Walker, where the cerebellar vermis is small, looking at the fastigium. So to uh, recap, we have dandy Walker malformation, cerebellar vermi hypoplasia, both the vermis is small, different appearances, and uh, you have the, you can look at the tail sign and the fastigium that are typical of dandy Walker. The other, black pouch cyst, megacerebellar mania, and arachnoid cyst, they all have normal size vermis. Now we need to distinguish between cerebellar hypoplasia and cerebellar atrophy. So uh, what is the difference? You see these three different uh, patients. Let's start with the one on the right. In this case, you have unilateral small cerebellum, but you don't see enlarged fissures. So this is unilateral cerebellar hypoplasia. When you see a unilateral cerebellar hypoplasia, remember this most likely due to an insult as well in the uh, prenatal, a bit later on than the walker, there is no widening of the cerebellar fissure and it's not progressive. When you have, uh, again, a situation uh, of global cerebellar hypoplasia, but again, without the widening of the cerebellar uh, fissure, you call it global cerebellar hypoplasia. It's not long asymmetric. And in this case, you can have genetic or um, uh, congenital infection. But you need to know that this is the definition of cerebral hypoplasia, just a normal kind of uh, a shaped cerebellum, but smaller. While when you have this widening of the fissure, 
we call it at, um, cerebellar atrophy. And in this case, you have a 23 months old um, child with uh, a history of hypoglycemia at birth, but clearly there is a cerebellar atrophy with this widening of the cerebellar fissure. And this is a congenital disorder of uh, um, glycosylation that is the typical pure isolated cerebellar atrophy. So progressive widening of the fissure, we call it cerebellar atrophy. And this will have a wide differential, but in this case, uh, unlike the, the cerebellar hypoplasia or the dandy walker, we will have a lot of genetic cause for it. For it. Uh, pitfall, sometimes the atrophy is slowly or non-progressive. And another important paper that you can look at is this from Poretti. It's a bit old, but you see they divide the, the, the cause for pure cerebellar atrophy, or if you connect the dots between cerebellum and other part of the brain, cerebellar and uh, atrophy plus hypoplasia, polycells, Metzbacher, 4-H, SBC, and so on. Or you can have cerebellar atrophy with very bright cortex, for instance, Marinesco, Sjogren, and so on. So this is a pattern recognition approach, but remember the first step is to distinguish cerebellar atrophy with widening of the fissure from the cerebellar hypoplasia. And once you have recognized the cerebellar atrophy, despite the name, you, are, you need to look at the brainstem. And if you have pontocerebellar atrophic changes, you call it pontocerebellar hypoplasia. And this is a problem because it's a misleading term. So these are actually atrophy, not hypoplasia in most of the time. So remember, pontocerebellar hypoplasia are actually an atrophic cerebellum associated with also small brainstem, in particularly the, the pons. There are 11 types, sometimes can be non-progressive, but the first thing is, again, pattern recognition. We need to distinguish between dragonfly appearance of the cerebellum and global factor. So look, what does it mean, dragonfly? Dragonfly means basically that in coronal, you have this appearance that looks exactly like a dragonfly, where the hemisphere of the cerebellum are more atrophic than the vermis. And the global atrophy is where the vermis is also involved. So this looks like a dragonfly. And this helps us in the differential. And as you can see, in both these cases, the pons is quite small. So you have ponto cerebella hypoplasia. And these are all the genes. But the important thing, the tips, is that once you, as a radiologist or, or pediatric neurology, pick up the association between uh, cerebellar atrophy and small pons, you ask for the panel. So this is the first step. There is no way to panic. One example of pattern recognition is a specific kind of cerebellar, uh, pontocerebellar hypoplasia. Look at this. The vermis is quite chunky, but the um, hemisphere are very, very small. So we have a dragonfly appearance on coronal in these three patients. On top of that, look at the corpus callosum here. It's so thin, so small, and there is a PVL-like pattern. So basically, there is no white matter whatsoever, small basal ganga, dark thalami, and this figure of eight here in the mesencephal. So when you have this pontocerebellar hypoplasia dragonfly associated with this massive PVL and figure of eight of the brainstem, you have a specific PCH type nine. And this sometimes is not in all the panels, so it's very important to pick up this association. Again, pattern recognition. Another example of pattern recognition, you have cerebellar cyst. They can be isolated with normal cerebrum like that, lama one mutation, or can be associated with Z-shaped brainstem and cobblestone malformation, and this is a walker warburg malformation, or can be associated with this strange appearance of the frontal lobe. This is actually polymicrogyric frontal lobe plus cyst. We have GPR56. You don't need to know all this gene, but just to focus on this specific radiological finding, start from there and then expand your diagnosis. Um, so it's important, the pattern recognition for us, Another two-year-old perinatal is sort of difficult swallowing, uh, swallowing. The child is also deaf. Look at this. The pons is completely gone, but there is a sort of hunchback here going posteriorly into the fourth ventricle. In this case, the, the cerebellum looks normal, but the, the brainstem is very, very abnormal. And also the child has inner ear malformation. 
If we do DTI, you see that this is, DTI is a way that we have to show the fibers in the brain. And look at the fiber here, there are interrupted at the level of the pons. And if we look at the axial, this is a normal axial. The red fibers are transfer pontine fibers. And then there is the sending corticospinal tract and the sending posterior fibers in a normal patient. In the abnormal patient with this disease, the transfer, uh, the transfer pontine uh, fibers are stuck posteriorly and there is a smaller descending fibers. And this association with this typical hunchback of the brainstem is called pontine tegmental cap dysplasia. Again, a constellation of findings typically associated with dysplastic in area that give us the diagnosis. Another two cases, finally, again, remember the initial slide about the anatomy, look at this cerebellum, there is no interruption between the two lobes. They are fused together. The, the fish should go right to left. And in this case, this is a control. You see there is the vermis in the center. There is also alopecia. And this is typical of rhomboencephalosynapsis, which is another malformation of the, um, uh, of the, the cerebellum where the two hemispheres are fused together. We don't know the cause, but sometimes there is this association gomez lopez hernandez syndrome with Roman cephalosynapsis, scalpalopecia, like in this case, and trigeminal dysfunction, which is a clinical dysfunction. So again, you put together clinic and radiology. Uh, we have a lot of other malformation. This is the typical molar tooth appearance in a child, again, with abnormal brainstem. This looks like a molar tooth, the brainstem, the midbrain on axial, and it's due to the fact that um, uh, the lateral, uh, sorry, the superior cerebral peduncle are thickened and horizontalized. Again, keep looking, there is uh, um, polydactyly, and this is typical of Joubert syndrome. Also in this case, you can do DTI and you see these horizontal anterior posterior tracts without the normal decussation that this, this, this is a normal patient with this red dot, that is the decussation of the superior cerebellar peduncles, which is not present. So my pearl is, if you have malformation of the brainstem, use the DTI, it's very, very important. And of course you recognize Joubert and you do a um, panel. So very, very important to do a panel. These are ciliopathy, multi-organ involvement, uh, but, as a neuroradiologist, I just look at the Joubert and do the panel. And of course, sometimes you have a lot of other things like hypothalamic hamartoma, hamartomas of the tongues, and this looks like a oropartial digital six, which is a type of Joubert. But other times, is the Joubert is the only thing you have, and the combination is not specific. So it's just our rule is just to ask for the panel. Finally, look at this combination of findings. This four year um, old, and again, look at this patterning defect in comparison to the brainstem in Sagittal that I showed you before. The pons has the same height of the, the midbrain, and, and uh, here the medulla oblongata. Again, cerebellar vermis is a bit small, but keep looking. Small corpus callosum here, rotated, anteriorly rotated uh, basal ganglia. You may have a bit of polymicrogyria here. Look at the dysplastic vermis. So you have all this combination of this morphic uh, um, brainstem, in particularly the uh, middle cerebellar peduncle, patterning defect, corpus callosum, malformation of the cortex, unusually orientated basal ganglia. This combination of findings suggests strongly tubulinopathy, whose uh, phenotype is variable, but again, is characterized by the, some association between posterior fossa malformation and malformation of the cerebrum of the supratentorial brain. Uh, finally, another pattern recognition. This is a deaf child. Look at the corpus callosum is very small, but we also have polymicrogyria. Here, look at the cortex, colpocephaly, abnormal heterotopia. Why I'm showing you this case. Look at the, the um, uh, cerebellar hemisphere. Look at the foliation, it's very dysplastic, in particular the inferior um, part of the hemisphere. This combination in a deaf child is typical of Chadley McCulloch syndrome. Why is so important? Because if you see something like that in the fetal scan, this will be associated with very good prognosis. So you need to 
recognize this specific dysplasia of the cerebellum in association with this heterotope polymicrogyria because these parents, they need to be aware that they should not abort, um, do an abortion. So what are my take home messages? First of all, you need to know the anatomy, the normal shape of the brainstem, the normal foliation. Then new stuff about Dandy Walker. So Dandy Walker seems to be due to an insult very early in gestation. And you can distinguish from the cerebellar hypoplasia because of the pastigium, so the acute angle of the, of the fourth ventricle. But also you can distinguish from black pouch cyst and other cystic malformation that do not have prognostic uh, uh, impact, okay? So very, very important. Distinguishing cerebellar atrophy with wide fissure from hypoplasia, which is normally formed cerebellum, but smaller is very important because they have different um, genetic or environmental uh, causes. Use the pattern recognition. And this lecture together with other lecture is on YouTube. So please, uh, uh, feel free to uh, check. Um, I will put uh, on again my camera. Thank you very much for the um, invitation. This is where I am from. Uh, I mean, not the ruins, but uh, in the south of Italy, there are very beautiful ruins. Uh, so uh, thank you very much. And um, um, I will be taking question. Um, I will be connecting to take question now.